Hello and welcome to Heresy, the show that argues against received wisdom. This is where you hear the unexpected, like Lady Gaga saying, Have you got something a little more demure? I'd feel silly in this. <laughs> Unfortunately, Lady Gaga can't be with us. She's having a quiet night at home with Lord Gaga. <laughs> it's jigsaw night. <laughs> In her place, I'm delighted to welcome comedians Natalie Haynes and Marcus Brigstock and God's own heretic, the Reverend Richard Coles. We're going to hear three opinions which the majority of people hold, and we're going to tell people they're wrong. Our first one involves a weighty, troublesome and difficult issue that affects us all. Transport strikes. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round all day long. Of course, the wheels on the bus don't go round and round if the driver's on strike. 83% of our live audience here agree with the opinion transport strikes are bad for commuters. When commuter trains or even planes are stopped by industrial action, it hits real people with real jobs. Estate agents, management consultants, PR executives, <laughs> but also real people with real jobs. <laughs> Marcus Briggs, why should these people actually be welcoming the strikes? Because at the end of a day of transport strikes, you get such wonderful and fascinating stories on the news uh, as to how people bravely and gallantly <laughs> made it into work with their terrific, endlessly hilarious tales of pluck is really what it is. Just people going, I crawled to work on my chin. It was brilliant. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so just, just for those, for those wonderful stories, you know? Well, I think people generally do want to get to work. That's why they're annoyed with the strike. Yeah. But I also think... People who work on the railways probably want to get to work. So, Natalie Haynes, wouldn't you think if they're not going into work, they might have a good reason? Yeah, I'd think, woo, day off. That's what I'd be thinking. <laughs> I'd be thinking, brilliant. One, I don't have to be on a train. Trains, buses, are full of germs. It doesn't matter how you look at it, they are basically pigeons, right? <laughs> Except slower. <laughs> What do you think, Richard Coles? Good excuse not to go to work? I'm all in favour of transport strikes. I think they encourage the building up of moral fibre. <laughs> I did have a lapse, I have to say, going up to Glasgow the day after the volcanic cloud came across. All the seat reservation system broke down on the Virgin Pendolino. It goes past um, my window. And there are these guys sitting in our seats, and I went, excuse me, you're in our seats, and then about half an hour later I said, look, OK, are you going to move? And they said no, and I thought, well, I'll go get the train manager. And I thought, no, I'm not going to get the train manager. I felt enormously morally superior until about Penrith when I finally did evict them from the seats and got to sit down. But good to feel morally superior, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I live truly over a station, uh, and every now and then they decide to do a bit of engineering work in the middle of the night. One, they shine quite bright lights into my house. Don't do that, it's annoying. Um, two, at one point, about three weeks ago, at half past one in the morning, there was a strange scratching noise outside our window, and it turned out to be a man hitting the platform with a broom. That is not maintenance. <laughs> if he goes on strike, no one will miss him. Generally, though, they're on strike because they think there's something wrong with the train service. So I'm assuming that people that are against this think that everything on the railways runs smoothly and efficiently. Uh, Marcus Brooks, look, have you ever travelled by train? Um... <laughs> Yes, no, I have, very often, and, and they are obviously uh, terrific because so many people seem so very keen to get on them. I mean, whenever I've been on in the mornings, y you, can't, you can't keep people out, <laughs> no matter how firmly you stand across the doorway. <laughs> I mean, they literally love it. It's like, it's like Alton Towers. <laughs> Really, really exciting. And I, I think a day off from that, when there is a strike, is, is quite a nice thing. It's like when we get a snow day. That's brilliant. You just see people making eye contact with each other and realising there are other human beings, and then obviously hurrying away, because it's <laughs> awful. But um... It's become a sort of lifestyle choice. I mean, I was interested about militant trolley dollies, British Airways strike. I mean, it's not flat caps and sandwiches and beer, is it? I mean, it's kind of odd, that. The idea of a militant trolley dolly. I like the idea of BA's cabin staff having flat caps and beer. <laughs> <laughs> You're out for a drink. 
but it's true. The newspapers try to paint them as these kind of militant revolutionaries. They're cabin group. They're people who draw a curtain between first class and economy. Mm. Natalie, can you imagine those people as revolutionaries? No. No, I can't. Because, in essence, and I realise that they will all now write to me and say, oh, if we weren't there, then... Right, if you weren't there, then, like in every other plane crash, everyone would die and everyone would die. All you do is bring me a large gin after there was some turbulence and we didn't die. (laughs) So... (laughs) Thank you for the gin, but I could get my own gin. In my house, I get gin on my own all the time, and it's absolutely fine. You mentioned the ash cloud before, Richard. Yeah. Of course, that stopped transport in a, in a big way. People were stranded all over the world. Could you see any good in that? Oh, lots and lots, yes. I think it's nice to stay put a bit, really. It was very good for me because it was my week's holiday, and I was on the Mull of Kintyre. And the peace of that was not disrupted by EasyJet going overhead or bits of frozen lavatory falling onto <laughs> the beach. And also there was no jet stream in the sky. It was great. Some people said it was possible that there would be no planes all summer or all year. Is there a plus side to that? Uh, I wouldn't have to go to a wedding of someone I barely like or know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, the, the, the two wars we've seen in the Middle East have really divided this country. But, you know, Iceland have done our banks and have now done our transport system. <laughs> and I, I don't know about anyone else here, but I've always operated a three strikes in your outfit. <laughs> My feeling is their next move will be to kidnap Michael Palin. <laughs> and then I think quite legitimately we can, uh, we can have them. <laughs> What they have in common, I suppose, the volcanic problems and the strikes, is that they both hit at our assumption that we can get on a form of fast transport at any point and get anywhere. Yes. Do we take that too much for granted? Well, that's dangerous, isn't it? I mean, I found myself outside Bedford for about four hours in the middle of the night because I got on a train at London to go to Kettering. It's not a long way. It's 48 minutes or something. And then everything just broke down. And I ended up, you know... 20 minutes in, and I was, the day was completely lost. I was stranded in Bedfordshire, near a Sainsbury's, which wasn't open, waiting with 3,000 people for a replacement bus service, which was coming from Argyleshire, as far as I could tell. Tell me this. How long would you have stood there before breaking into the Sainsbury's and stealing some food? It was borderline, <laughs> in my case. Um, but the sandwich choice was fairly poor, being Bedfordshire. <laughs> When the replacement bus service arrived, it was driven by a man who's very fond of country and western. He played it really loud, all the way <laughs> to Kettering. Excellent. Do you, any, any particular artists? I can't remember. It was just, it was just sort of uh, aggressive country western, twangy banjo noise. Oh, new country. New country. <laughs> That's got some amazingly vicious lyrics as well. Yeah. Really nuts. Yeah. Let's go over there and bomb those people back into the Stone Age. <laughs> Jesus loves us, but he hates them. You know the guy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go to the audience here. Brian Jacobs, you strongly agree that transport strikes are terrible for commuters. Have you been personally affected? Yes, I'm, I'm planning to go to the States later this year. I'm not sure whether I should be booking the flight or not. So it could be preventing me going to a convention. What is the nature of the convention? It's a hypnotherapy convention. (laughs) But... They just hypnotise the cabin crew into working. (laughs) Or have some hypnotherapy here and just pretend you've been. (laughs) Physician, heal thyself. Yeah. (laughs) Would you be less annoyed if you couldn't get to the convention because of volcanic cloud than industrial action? Well, that's the other problem. Um, the insurance company don't cover the, either the volcanic cloud or the BA strike. So if I book a ticket... Are they both acts of God? Uh, <laughs> it seems like, yes. Oh. <laughs> Is a volcanic eruption an act of God? Well... <laughs> speaking as a clergyman, No. Speaking as someone whose pension scheme relies on reinsurance, yes. Well, I think we can wind that up there. (laughs) So let's have a pat on the back for transport strikers who only want to improve the system like the rest of us. And they've never hampered our movements like the ash cloud has. That left people stranded all over the world. Even Whitney Houston was trapped during the first eruption after a concert in Dublin. She went to the ferry terminal, but there was an enormous line. 
And that perked her up enough to get on the ferry. <laughs> Let's move on to a modern love story. It's the fairy tale romance of Prince William and Kate Middleton. Now, before we go any further, apparently 15% of our audience don't know who Kate Middleton is. <laughs> I'm impressed. I, I'm hoping that means you're a, a room full of high-minded intellectuals. I'm worried it means you're all here on a day trip from Sweden and you're not going to <laughs> understand any of it. But for the record, Kate Middleton is the girlfriend of Prince William, the heir to the throne, and they've been together for about 97 years. And at the time of recording, Kate Middleton and a breathless nation are still waiting for an engagement. Though journalists say Buckingham Palace has secretly cleared two days in June for an announcement. Two days? Who's making the announcement? Neil Kinnock? <laughs> Whether or not the happy couple are engaged by the time you're listening to this, 82% of our live audience believe Kate Middleton should get a job. <laughs> That's even though 15% of you don't know who she is. <laughs> you still think she should get out there in the workplace. <laughs> Natalie Haynes, should Kate get a job? She should not, for the excellent reason that, by and large, people in the orbit of the royal family are, for want of a better phrase, talent vacuums. <laughs> and... <laughs> She used to work, I think, briefly for a clothing chain. Sarah Ferguson has written children's books. Um, some nondescript prince who looks a bit like Prince Charles but isn't uh, worked for the really useful company and then had a TV production company. And these are all jobs that people would genuinely, you know, kill their own parents to get. So I kind of think there's already really high youth unemployment. Why don't we, since we're going to be keeping her anyway once she marries Prince William, why don't we just let somebody who'd really like the job, worked hard and didn't have millionaire parents have it? Ta-da! <laughs> it's a bit worrying, isn't it? There's nothing left to fall back on because isn't her mother a trolley dolly? I think they're millionaires. <laughs> now, a millionaire trolley dolly. Yeah, a millionaire yeah. trolley dolly. People, I'm not gonna, people are snobbish about Kate Middleton's mother because she was cabin crew, and I'm not having that. She's a very good mother. She gave that child everything it needed miniature packets of peanuts, ginger <laughs> ale, <laughs> napkins. <laughs> Richard Coles, you must give young couples advice all the time. What would you advise this prospective young bride? Don't get a job. <laughs> For what reason? Because monarchy should be ornamental. If you're going to have it, have it ornamental. I don't want the Queen of England... I don't want to meet the Queen of England and think, you racked up my nectar points this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus, do you think Kate should get a job? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, I mean, she's... She's sort of feckless and posh and self-important and opinionated and overprivileged and pompous. And frankly, I just don't want competition for what <laughs> I already do. Yeah, I mean, I, I seriously don't think she, she should get a job because in the long run, you know, the fewer people that meet Kate Middleton the fewer biographies there will be later on. <laughs> if she was going to get a job, what sort of job should she get? Colouring in. <laughs> <laughs> Something in computers. Isn't that what everyone does now? What do you do? Something in computers. Right, that hasn't helped at all. If Kate Middleton were going to get married and have children and raise a family, I'm sure she'd have a bit of help. But that would be... <laughs> be valid in itself. I think the sense that she should get a job is part of, I think, too strict an idea all over, that it isn't enough just to get married and have children and run yeah, a house. And I think that is enough. That a person is valued by, by the work that they do, as opposed to how nice they are or whether they get around in. Well, I bet Kate always gets around in. Let's go to the audience. Where's Stuart She's not Webb? in, is she? <laughs> Stuart Webb, you strongly agree that Kate Middleton should get a job. What job do you think she should get? Chancellor. <laughs> I think she'd make of, a good of chancellor. Of the Exchequer. <laughs> yes. When, when people say about the royals that they're good with money, what, <laughs> it's, what they mean is two things. They're good with money. 